God, speak to us this day that we may hear your voice anew. By the power of your Holy Spirit, nudge us in the direction of the life that you would have us lead. And may my words and our meditations and our response to what we hear be acceptable in your sight, for you're our life, our love, and our hope. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Vulnerable. I'd like to speak with you this morning about being vulnerable. Have you ever experienced that? Uh, feeling a bit nervous, anxious, exposed, uh, perhaps even ashamed? Um, I'd like to speak with you about God in response to our vulnerability. A couple of, uh, not very long ago, I happened to be at a party. There were nine adults at the party and an 18-month-old child. <laughs> and in the course of the, the party, someone told a joke. Be believe it or not, I don't remember the joke. <laughs> I don't even remember who told the joke, but I do remember what happened when the joke was told. We, we laughed. Not just the little polite ha 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 like sometimes happens when I tell a joke on Sunday morning. <laughs> this, this was a really good joke, and uh, everybody got it in the room, and w w we laughed. You know, the, the full body experience laugh where we were just shaking and, and tears of laughter coming down the face of one of the persons who was just uncontrollable laughter. We all got the joke and it was, I don't know if you've ever been in a room like that where everybody is just laughing. It's electric. It was wonderful. It was just liberating. I mentioned we all got the joke except for the 18-month-old. And that 18-month-old child, I, I don't think, had ever been in a room where that kind of laughter was taking place. And we weren't sure what happened. The, the mother of the child thought that maybe she, she thought we were laughing at her. And, and suddenly, she melted. And she just started bawling uncontrollably. We stopped laughing. <laughs> and um, we, we comforted that, that child, told her it wasn't, you know, we weren't laughing at her. We tried to give her assurance. But I was reminded of vulnerability that happens all the time. That sometimes, uh, you know, we may have things going just fine, but there might be somebody over here who's fragile and broken. If you can believe it, pastors even experience vulnerability. Um, I was at a workshop once. There are 300 clergy from all over the country, all different kinds of denominations present in the room. And the leader of the workshop, for some reason, decided to ask us collectively and individually if we'd ever um, had nightmares. And he said, if you've had nightmares, so write them down on this piece of paper and turn it in. And we turned it in, and they must have had somebody reading and tabulating, and they came back and announced in the afternoon that they had discovered that uh, by far and away the, the vast majority of clergy all had the same nightmare. And the nightmare was that we were asleep and we, um, um, it was time to preach, and we were late. <laughs> and not only were we late, but then when we were uh, running to, to church, we couldn't find our sermon. <laughs> and, and then when we actually got to church and began preaching, we looked down and discovered we had no pants on. <laughs> 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 and the uh, clergy feel vulnerable, too. Um, this scripture passage hit me that the, um, this miracle of Jesus, this changing of the water into wine, occurred at a moment 
of great vulnerability for a bride and groom. I have done in my life probably 700 weddings, officiated at weddings, but I didn't really know weddings until five years ago when my own daughter got married. When you're on the inside planning a wedding, I just out of curiosity, how many of you have had this experience where you've had to plan a wedding or be a part of a wedding for, yeah, well, it's different. I mean, you can be the pastor and officiate, but when you're family and you're putting on the wedding, in, in fact, when you're the father of the bride and you're paying for the thing, it, it just, it's different. Um, and I, I learned, first of all, how much weddings cost. <laughs> That's just, on a pastor's salary, I, I was quickly trying to figure out, how can we do this for less? And, and uh, my daughter and her fiancé really liked the West Michigan Lakeshore, so he said, great, we'll do it on the beach. And thinking, we could do a wedding for, for cheap on the beach. And then I was reminded, it's Michigan. <laughs> You know, you have to have plan B in case of rain or snow or you just... And so I said, okay, we'll get a tent. And, and well, where are they going to sit, Dad? We don't want them just sitting on the beach. Well, okay, we'll get tables and chairs. Well, if we're going to have those wedding and the reception on the beach, what, what about the food? We don't want them served on paper plates. They didn't like my idea of a picnic where everybody brought their own. <laughs> And so I said, okay, we'll, um, um, we'll get dishes. We'll, we'll rent the dishes. And, and then you started tabbing. We didn't have it on the beach. It's not cheap on the beach. <laughs> you, you, get a, you get a tent and you rent the tables, you rent the chairs, you rent the plates and the dishes. Five years ago, it was $35 per person. And that didn't put any food on it, no decorations, nothing, um, just to get it out to the beach. And so we decided to go somewhere else. But it wasn't any cheaper there either. <laughs> and uh, you, you want the wedding to go perfectly. I, I, you just because all your friends and your family and, and people who know you are coming. And you don't, you get one shot to do this. And there's always, there's always something that goes wrong. And what you, what you don't want to have happen is what happened to the, th there was a wedding, and I wasn't at this wedding, but I heard about it. At, it took place in North Muskegon. It was the wedding where they planned everything, and they, they had it, I don't know if you've been to North Muskegon, Custer Park, it overlooks Muskegon Lake. It's a beautiful place. They've got a nice gazebo there, lots of weddings in the summertime, and this couple, they, they, they planned for their perfect day, and everything was going perfectly, and they, they, they had the, the processional down the sidewalk. They got to the gazebo, the bridal parties, spread out, the people are seated in the white chairs that were rented and put in place and all the guests were there. And uh, that was the week that they had installed the new sprinkler system in the park and, and they forgot to give the memo to the, um, from the, <laughs> to the grounds crew and just as everybody got ready and the pastor was about to say, who presents this woman to be married to this man, everybody heard the sound. They're still talking about that wedding. <laughs> um, they don't remember the name of the bride or the groom, <laughs> but they remember the wedding. A, a, a bride's worst nightmare. They have something, and it, it was happening at the wedding in Cana. The, the bride and the groom, and and the wedding and the party, and they had gotten to the party, and the the, the worst thing happened. They ran out of wine early in the process. Mary, and I don't know why Mary cared. There's speculation that perhaps she was related to the bride or maybe she had been assigned to be the mistress of ceremonies, the, the person who, who is essential at, at weddings, behind the scenes, running interference, trying to make sure that everything's managed well, but, but she noticed it. And she turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, please take care of this. I, I love Jesus' response. <laughs> Did you hear the hesitation? It's not my time. <laughs> um, 
I, I feel that way, and maybe you do too. I, I, I've noticed it's sort of a recurring theme among God's people when you get tapped on the shoulder and said, hey, can you do this? And, and often, it's not my time. I, I feel that sometimes when confronted by the big issues in the world. Do, do you? Um, Syrian refugee crisis, global warming, uh, Islamic extremism, um, gambling going in up the street. Um, do, you, do you feel, I, I, there's a part of me that says, well, that, that's not my, my business, but it is. And Jesus accepted the responsibility that there, there's some thinking that Mary had asked Jesus to serve in this capacity to take care of this potential embarrassment for a bride and groom uh, because Mary was identifying him as the goel of the family. Jewish families had a goel. I think it's a great idea. The, the goel is the redeemer. It's often the eldest male in the family. Uh, the, the eldest male is um, responsible is the person so that if something happens in the family that uh, is potentially embarrassing, the, the goel uh, it takes ownership, responsibility to handle it. If there's a member of the family that's ha having trouble with finances or if there's an embarrassment to the family reputation, the, the goel steps in to handle it. And Joseph's not mentioned anywhere here. Uh, the speculation is that by this point in Jesus' life, Joseph has died. The, the last time Joseph is mentioned in the New Testament, Jesus' father is uh, when Jesus is 12 years of age. Um, anyway, Jesus does step up, and he tells the servants to go out to where the stone jars are and to fill them. These are jars set aside for ritual purification. The jars on the cover of the bulletin are way too small, uh, but it's, uh, it's speculated. The Bible says they, they were 20 or 30 gallons worth. A, a 30 gallon, that's about the size of a metal trash can. You, you know how big that is. Um, six of them, and I have to wonder why they needed to be filled. These jars were, were present for the, the washing of hands prior and, and feet and faces prior to worship. If you go to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, today there's an Islamic mosque there, but they have, they have fountains where people can come and cleanse themselves before coming before God. And I, I, I recognize this in my own family. I don't know about you, but Saturday night was bath night at our house uh, because they, it was a big deal. We had to get cleaned up for, for Sunday morning. Um, th these jars are empty, and, and I wondered if... Um, Either be, it's because people did use them and, and drained them, or, or maybe it was another item. I, I've seen this happen in weddings. The bride and groom, they, they plan for the honeymoon, and they plan for the band, and they plan for the food, and they plan for the decorations, and they plan for the pictures and the videos. And oh, by the way, there is that ceremony. Um, and, and maybe... Jesus was pointing out an oversight. If you fill these jars, if you place your attention where it needs to be on being clean and being right before God. Anyway, he filled the jars, and that's where they experienced the extravagant generosity of God. Wine better than they had served up to that point in the wedding, 180 gallons worth. <laughs> Just <laughs> the whole town of Cana got wasted for a month. <laughs> I just, um, but it also is a helpful reminder of this first sign and miracle of God's. For me, when I'm feeling vulnerable, for the longest time, 
when I experienced vulnerability, I, I wanted to hide it, to cover it up, to pretend it wasn't there. What I wanted to, to show at church was my positive self, my, my good self, my all-together self. It's a reminder, I think, that the God we love loves all of us, even in our vulnerability. And when we bring that part of ourselves and say, God, help me, um, that the response that was given in Cana is a reminder to each of us of the kind of God we worship, overwhelming and extravagant generosity. May it be so for us.